Thanks very much for joining us today. My name's James. I'll be running you through this uh, webinar today uh, on patterns, challenges, and best practices for AWS accounts as part of your cloud strategy. So, um, as kind of a, a general summary, the AWS account construct provides a, a very clean and secure mechanism for isolating your resources and managing them in the AWS cloud. There are many kind of patterns or best practices that are often extolled as the ways you should kind of configure your, your AWS accounts. When it comes to actually implementing them, though, there's usually challenges around identity management, auditing, billing. This webinar examines some of the different patterns available for uh, covering those kind of different patterns and how you might implement them in AWS and delves a little bit deeper into the pros and cons of each of those account structures. So what we'll actually cover specifically, thank you for advancing the slides, is uh, what an AWS account is. So we'll discuss the construct of an AWS account, what it means and why it's useful. Then we'll talk about identity and access management, what the implications are of that and set some base levels around that. We'll talk about consolidated billing and linking AWS accounts together. And then I'll go through uh, using AWS accounts as boundaries. So for administrating, uh, administrative or governance boundaries within AWS. After that, we'll run through some of the usage patterns. So the different kind of ways you can configure your AWS accounts. And then we'll talk about how you can simplify your account strategy within AWS after that. So let's talk very briefly. I'll get the slide to advance about the AWS account and what it means. I apologize for the picture cutting over some of the text on the screen there. It appears to have been uh, shrunk as part of my, my web display, so hopefully everyone can see that. Um, an AWS account is effectively, it's a unique construct to describe the relationship between AWS and a customer. So uh, typically it's a unique 12 digit number, uh, which is used as a reference point for each AWS account within AWS. Um, and they are, primarily used to help identify different accounts and they form part of the, the construction of an Amazon resource name or an ARM. Um, the AWS account, its primary function is uh, to group your resources together and from a, an account management point of view, it contains your payment method, your invoicing details and where you actually receive kind of that, that information through the AWS console. Um, I just mentioned Amazon resource names or ARMs, it's important to describe what those are. Um, the account ID forms part of a, a resource identifier effectively that allows you to distinguish between resources such as IAM users or SQS queues in different AWS accounts. So an ARN is typically con con uh, comprised of a partition followed by a service, a region, and then the account ID, which is the 12 digit number I just mentioned, and then the resource or resource type underneath that. Um, the service, uh, the, the, the purpose of the ARN is to help you identify the different resources between your accounts and when you look at the partition names, it becomes very obvious how you can quickly differentiate between your accounts, your resources, the services and the regions that they're deployed into. One of the other important things to note about your AWS account is that when you create it, you are um, automatically setting up your root credentials, which is uh, the, the single sign-in identity that has complete access to all of the AWS services and resources in the account. Uh, this is called the root user and it's accessed by signing in with the email address and password you use to create the account. Um, and most importantly, it's actually where your AWS resources live inside your AWS account. Fairly obvious, but worth pointing out. We'll just wait for the slides to advance. So, Talking about identity and access management, it's a, a core con concept and topic when you start talking about AWS. AWS has a service called Identity and Access Management, I'll refer to it as IAM for short from now on, um, and it controls both the who and the what of rights and access within your account. So it's a web service, it's used to control access to the resources uh, for both your uh, IAM users and groups and roles, which we'll cover off in a minute as well. Um, you can use IAM to control who can access your resources and what they can actually do with those resources, as well as which resources they can access. So to, to set kind of some, some base level expectations, um, I'll cover off quickly what the difference between an IAM user, a group, and a role is. Um, an IAM user is an entity that you create within AWS IAM to represent a person or a service. You use it to interact with the, the, the web services provided by AWS. A user in AWS consists of a name and credentials that go with it. An IAM group is simply a collection of IAM users that you can apply policies to. Typically, you can apply a policy directly to a user, 
when you want to start scaling and applying policies to broad groups of users, you create an IAM group, assign the policy or the rights to that group, and it inherits to the users that are members of that. It's effectively a scaling model to, to um, it's effectively a scaling model for IAM role uh, permissions and access rights. And it's important to note that a group isn't really a true identity within IAM because you can't use it to, to identify uh, a group when you're writing a permissions policy. It, it, it is literally a construct for attaching policies to many users at once. Uh, IAM roles are another form of assigning rights and permissions. An IAM role is similar to a user in that it's an AWS identity. You attach policies that contain permissions to, to the, the role and it describes what that identity can and cannot do inside AWS. However, instead of being associated with a single person or a single IAM user, a role is actually intended to be assumable by anyone. So the idea of a role is that you can assume it as a user, you can assume it as uh, a resource within AWS, and you don't actually need to have an IAM user created specifically tied to it. A role doesn't have any actual credentials, so passwords or access keys associated with it. Instead, if a user is assigned to a role, access keys are created dynamically and provided to the user. Uh, finally, the important thing to note about IAM is that many organizations consider a, an AWS account to be a natural organizational divider or boundary. So typical usage patterns within organizations that might have multiple divisions or business units would be to issue an AWS account to each of those divisions or business units. That way they're actually granting full control of an AWS account and the resources within it to that business unit or division, but ultimately blocking each, each business unit from interacting with the other the other units AWS resources so when we talk about IAM and how it relates to multiple accounts uh, there are a couple of important things to note so AWS IAM provides several methods of um, pro providing identity and authorization to users so you can create permissions you don't have to necessarily use IAM users. You can actually work through sev several other different methods of accessing and authenticating users. We'll quickly run through those now. So the first one I've already touched upon are discrete IAM users per account. So this is a simple and recognizable way of managing users. Everyone's used to going and creating user accounts for people. You can then assign permissions to them. Um, it's probably the easiest and the lowest area to entry to set up your IAM within AWS, but obviously as you scale and, and add more of these over time, the complexity of, of managing those and the overhead of maintaining multiple identities if you have multiple AWS accounts becomes problematic. The next one we'll cover is the AWS Security Token Service, or STS for short. Uh, this is basically a mechanism for providing, uh, creating and providing trusted users with temporary security credentials that then can have policies and access assigned to your AWS resources. It works almost identically to, to long-term access key credentials that you would issue to IAM users, but there are a couple of important differences. As the name implies, temporary security credentials are short-term. You can create them so that they last anything from a few minutes to, to an hour, but they do have a, a short-term life expectancy. And temporary credentials are not stored with the user, but created dynamically. So when you make the request to actually um, receive those STS credentials, they're dynamic, dynamically created at runtime and provided to the user as they request them. The next piece we'll cover is cross-account IAM roles, so cross-account access between multiple AWS accounts. It's a method of granting access, resource, access to resources in one account from a, a secondary or tertiary account. So you would have a trusted principal in a different account. This is, this is what's referred to as cross-account access. So roles are the primary way that you would grant cross-account access. Uh, with some AWS web services, you can actually attach policies directly to a resource instead of using an IAM role as a proxy. Uh, then we'll also touch on identity providers and federations, so IDP for existing identity stores. This is an important one for most enterprises or organizations that already have existing identity stores. So uh, when we talk about this IDP, we're talking about creating a trusted relationship between IAM inside AWS and an external authentication provider. Typically, that would be an open ID compatible or a, a web IDP, such as logging with Amazon or Facebook or Google. Um, or via SAML, it would actually be connecting to an existing enterprise um, identity source, so something like Microsoft's Active Directory Federation services. 
authentication would be handled by that external identity provider, so Microsoft ADFS in this example, and temporary credentials are issued via IAM to that authenticated user. Uh, I touched briefly on IAM roles and resource policies. IAM roles are particularly useful here because you attach permissions to the role, not a specific user, as I mentioned a moment ago. And therefore, it can be used by an IAM user in the same AWS account, or it can be used cross account from a different trusted AWS account. Um, or a web service such as EC2 can use it to assume permissions and identities, so you don't actually need to put an IAM user on an EC2 instance to access other AWS web services. And as I just mentioned, an authenticated user from an external uh, identity provider such as Microsoft ADFS or an open ID provider, or even a custom broker can assume that role. And it's how you really grant permissions using an external identity store in federation. The other piece that I just briefly touched upon was resource policies. So when you look at IAM roles and resource policies, instead of using an IAM role as a proxy for those resources, you can actually use uh, resource policies in some of the AWS services out there. So services that support Resource policies at the moment are S3, SNS, SQS, Glacier, OpsWorks, Stacks, and also Lambda functions, which makes this very useful. What we're effectively doing is uh, directly applying permissions to the resource that we're accessing. So you provide a uh, the, the benefit here really is that a user doesn't have to give up their permissions in their trusted account. So if I'm in account A and I wish to assume a role inside account B, so in, in an example I'll give here, if you want to copy something from an S3 bucket in your main account to a secondary account you have cross account access into, if you are using an IAM role, you have to assume that role in the secondary account, and that means you lose your permissions to your S3 bucket in your primary account. If you put resource policies on the S3 bucket in the secondary account, you can actually maintain your, your access rights in your primary account while you access the S3 bucket in the secondary account means you can copy content easily between one bucket and another uh, in a secure manner. So, it, I mean, that's a very basic example, but it makes it a very useful function and it's worth keeping in mind resource policies, re resource policies are something that you need to leverage when you're scaling across multiple accounts. So, that was a brief overview of IAM and some of the benefits or some of the methods of, of accessing it and using it. Um, what I'm going to touch on quickly now is consolidated billing. It's one of the main problems people face when they use multiple AWS accounts and you end up with multiple bills and payment methods. Um, consolidated billing is a, a method of actually linking two, a, two or more AWS accounts. Consolidated billing at its core is a combined view of the AWS charges across all of the accounts that you have linked together. They roll up into a single master payer account. You can get a cost report either for individual accounts or you can have one master detailed billing report. Um, consolidated billing is strictly uh, an accounting and billing feature, so it's not a method for uh, enforcing policy down into other accounts. There's no uh, master and child relationship that you can use to enforce control or identity management policies between accounts. It is purely for billing and accounting uh, purposes. However, it is still very, very useful, even if you can't use it for sharing compute resources between accounts or controlling policy. Um, why would you use consolidated billing today? So if you're running multiple AWS accounts, you want to get a single bill and have a single payment method, but you still need to be able to track each account's charges. So an example, you may have multiple projects and you may put each of those into their own AWS account. Still comes out the same payment method, but you want to be able to cost allocate or at least keep an eye on the costs of each of those projects. Um, or you may have multiple cost centers to track, um, or even you may have acquired a, a, a new company, your, your business may have acquired a new organization, and you actually want to integrate that slowly over time into your existing AWS structure, but you need to pick up the uh, payment and billing of the existing AWS infrastructure from the acquisition. So this would allow you to consolidate it onto the same bill and pay for the same payment method. Uh, it's important to note there are some some parts that don't really fall under consolidated billing. So non-usage charges are usually uh, things that people get called out upon. So when we look at uh, four main points that, that are worth covering, the first would be EC2 reserved instances. So RIs are a method of reserving capacity and gaining a, a pricing, a preferential pricing rate based on that commitment upfront for the reservation. 
Uh, you purchase RIs on an account by account basis, but when you have consolidated billing in your accounts linked, uh, you can actually purchase account, uh, RIs in account A or account B, and then account C can spin up instances that match the reservation type and uh, the region and availability zone. And if there are unused RIs of that same instance type, then the cost savings are allocated to those instances in account C. So it's a way of leveraging RIs across multiple accounts. So if you add accounts in over time, then you actually manage to, to save money across there, even if you're using different R, um, different accounts, but the same instance types across them. Obviously, one thing to note is if you then detach, say, account C in the diagram, if you detached it from account A as the master, the payer account, um, those RIs would stay with account C. So they don't transition between accounts. Just for a billing construct, it allows you to use it across the multiple accounts that are linked together. Uh, second one to cover is uh, RDS reserve DB instances. They function in a very similar way to EC2 RIs. It's worth noting that because uh, reserved DB instances within RDS are something that you should definitely be looking to leverage. Um, and then the final two points are AWS credits. So when you are receiving any credits from AWS, you can put them onto your account. If you link any of those accounts together, so if you had credits in account C and account B, um, you link them up to the master payer account in account A, those credits will actually get used to offset the consolidated bill. So if I had no credits in account A, but credits in C and B, the bill would come out through account A, and I would use those credits from the child accounts to offset some of that bill. Uh, again, it's worth noting, similar to our eyes, if you unlinked account C from that master payer account, the credits that were remaining would go with the unlinked account and wouldn't have been consumed up into account A as the master payer. And finally, AWS support charges are calculated on an account by account basis. Uh, so you need to subscribe to AWS support for each account independently to make that work. Now I'm going to touch on AWS accounts as boundaries. And this is where it gets interesting. So when we talk about AWS accounts, we use them as the, kind of the, the ultimate security boundary. Um, if you look at something like a VPC, for example. VPCs can obviously be connected within accounts and across accounts, but there are certain controls in place across accounts that make that more secure. Um, the most basic thing to, to remember is that when you have multiple AWS accounts, administrative control does not cross accounts by default. It's possible to configure it with some of the IAM methods we discussed earlier on, but by default, out of the box, an AWS account is isolated from any other AWS account, so it gives you that hard division between accounts for control governance. Um, it can simplify account-wide resource permissions. So if you are using separate AWS accounts, you can apply permissions to, uh, for example, a security group could be granted permissions for all of the uh, security groups within AWS, or security departments, or it could be granted permission for all security groups within an AWS account. If you're running a single account and there are many parts of a business that have their own separate security departments, you would have to specify which security groups they would have access to administer. So putting those into separate accounts provides that natural boundary. Um, I am by default is isolated as well. Again, you can configure cross account, but it's isolated by default. Uh, VPC peering is, is a, an interesting one to note. So if anyone's configured peering between VPCs at the moment, there's a, an important difference between intra and inter account VPC peering. Um, when you configure a VPC peering connect connection, the, the requesting VPC makes, makes that connection request over to the target or the peer VPC, and an administrator in the target must then accept the request. So once that peering connection has been established, you can just configure routing tables and traffic will flow between the connected VPCs. Without any specific configuration in place for IAM, it's, it's likely that the person who is initiating a peering request from target to, uh, from source to target VPC would have the permissions to accept that peering connection request in the target VPC. So effectively, one person could connect two VPCs together very easily by default. When you go cross-account peering for VPCs by the very nature, because IAM is isolated by default between accounts, the administrative control should sit with different people different IAM users or roles within those accounts. Therefore, there is actually that check and balance by default of connecting a, a VPC peer across account. Um, one of the other important points as well that's worth noting is uh, service limits. So if you look at an AWS account, there are a number of AWS service limits that exist by default. 
these limits are typically region specific and they control the, the amount of different resource types that can be created or spun up inside your AWS account. Uh, examples of these limits could include the number of VPCs per region, the number of EC2 auto scaling groups per region, or even the number of on-demand EC2 instances running per region. Now, most of these are soft limits and can be uh, increased at, at the request uh, at the customer's request to AWS. Um, you can submit a, a, a ticket to either rack as your managed service provider or AWS directly to have those soft limits increased, but it will take at least a minimum of 24 hours for that change to take effect. Um, it's something that often catches customers out, and it's important to note that um, if you've ever run, and uh, talking from real world experience, if you've ever had a, an AWS account where you're running a production environment as well as your dev or test environments, uh, if you have a, a soft limit in place on the number of EC2 on demand instances running in that, that region, you could be running your production environment with 10 EC2 instances, and you could have two or three development environments running with a number of EC2 instances as well. Now, your production environment is likely going to be configured to auto scale in response to traffic spikes. If you are running close to or at the number of EC2 on demand instances in your region, you experience a surge in traffic into your production environment, auto scaling will fail to spin up new instances because you are hitting that EC2 soft limit. So there's a very real risk that if you run prod and non-prod in one account, those soft limits can actually come to, to cause problems and service outage if you're not aware of the soft limits and, and managing those proactively. Again, that's something that is typically addressed by running separate accounts, so separate AWS accounts for non-production workloads versus production workloads to then have to manage separate limits. But it means you know that someone spinning up more and more dev environments over, over the course of a, a working day is not going to have a potential to impact your production environment. Um, and just quickly, what are the other kind of boundaries that an AWS account provides? So you can guarantee separate billing and payment methods between accounts unless you link them up in consolidated billing. Um, if you're using separate accounts and not using consolidated billing, you can guarantee that your RIs are only ever used within your account. Um, and most importantly as well, the last bullet point on here is the untaggable usage costs. So there are certain services or costs within AWS that you can't allocate tags to at the moment. Bandwidth is a really good example of that. If you're running a single AWS account with four or five different departments workloads in there and you need to do cost chargeback or even showback, it's impossible to take bandwidth and therefore it's impossible to accurately do showback or chargeback for the bandwidth costs that exist within an AWS account. The only way today to get around something like that, that bandwidth allocation is to run in separate AWS accounts. So if you have one cost center that pays for the AWS resources, in one AWS account, you can guarantee that the bandwidth used by that account will get charged back to the appropriate cost center. Um, and the final point is one that's not really a, a, a technical boundary as such, but if you're using multiple AWS accounts, you can minimize that human error. So there's always the possibility that someone creating a security group would put a reference into another security group and accidentally reference the wrong security group. Uh, or accidentally change an IAM policy attached to a role that would grant additional permissions that are unnecessary. Uh, mistakes happen, human error happens when you have a large complex system that you're trying to manage. If you separate your AWS accounts in a logical manner, you can actually help avoid some of that or mitigate some of that risk. So we've talked about AWS accounts as boundaries. There are some resources within AWS that natively support cross-account sharing. So there's four of them up here. So EC2 AMIs, EBS snapshots, RDS snapshots, and S3 buckets. Um, why is this useful? It's, an, it's a, a super useful feature and it's important to note because it makes data migration between accounts much, much easier. If, if you were unable to share snapshots or AMIs between accounts, you would have to manually migrate or use third-party tooling to move data between accounts. So if you think again about the scenario of production and non-production workloads, you may want to restore a, an RDS database snapshot from your production environment into a non-production environment for development or release testing. Today, that's enabled by this cross-account RDS snapshot sharing. Uh, and in actual fact, uh, recently AWS has announced that, uh, I think it was February the 11th, that within a region, RDS now even supports the private sharing of encrypted snapshots. So you can't publicly share them, but it means you can actually use your encrypted snapshots and, and cross-account share those privately. 
uh, within a region, which is, again is an important factor if you're using the security features of AWS to make sure you're encrypting your data at rest. So now we're going to start moving on to some of the patterns that, that we typically see for um, AWS account structure or usage, bearing in mind the, the information we just covered. So there are typically four main patterns for AWS account usage. Uh, we're going to go through each of them in turn and just cover some, some pros and cons of each. Um, so we'll start off with the single account or the fully centralized model. So this pattern is effectively the, the, the most straightforward account model. It is by default, it's what you start with in AWS when you set up your new account. It's a single AWS account, which is created and used to house all of your AWS resources for an organization. Um, this model is often preferred by kind of smaller organizations or companies who plan to have very few or simplistic workloads inside AWS. Um, or it can be used by a larger organization that has a fully centrally managed business and IT function. So this model is, is straightforward in the sense that it means the customer will receive a single billing report against a single payment method. They don't have to manage the complexity of multiple accounts for either access management in IAM or communication with uh, cross-account VPC peering or resource sharing. Um, it's low complexity because you only have that single IT function or, or organization managing it centrally. It's a, a simple governance model. Um, the downside to this is that you only have one set of AWS limits inside that account per region. So the example I gave earlier on of running prod and non-prod and potentially having prod impacted by too many non-prod environments running, very real risk here. Um, I use the, the term blast radius. I realize it's kind of a, a slang term, but effectively the blast radius is, is what I use to describe the possible risk of impact from an, an unintended or a, a misconfigured change. So if you accidentally remove access to something in an IAM role or policy, the blast radius is significantly larger when you're running every single workload inside a single AWS account. And then there's the challenge of cost allocation. So untaggable resources like bandwidth that I touched upon earlier, very real chance that you're going to be unable to do that cost allocation back when you're using a single account method. And moving on, the autonomous model. So this is a pattern which effectively use multiple unlinked AWS accounts. You get the benefits of a single account model while allowing autonomous business or IT functions. So if you have a, a large organization uh, that has geographic or departmental divisions in, in the way they manage their IT function, this would allow them to operate independently you would no longer have the, the, the centralized uh, payment method or billing structure in place that you have with a single account model. You'd actually be able to do charge back on a division or a business unit by business unit basis. It allows for that decentralized model that, that the governance can be arranged on a, an account by account basis. Um, and they can isolate their environments from other parts of the organization. Um, using this model as well, we're talking about the, the, the blast radius in the, the single account model. As you start to separate out, when you start thinking about the risk of account compromise or security vulnerabilities, that kind of minimizes across multiple accounts as you go. Uh, the more you segregate your workloads, the, the, the less you're exposing an attack surface that could effectively give someone an access route into more workloads than they've managed to compromise initially. So we talk about the, the decentralized business, business model, the fact that you still retain that low complexity per account, uh, you still retain the separate billing reports and, and methods of payment. Uh, but then you start to get to a point where you actually have to duplicate configuration and control. So IAM, for example, you would have to create multiple IAM policies, roles, users or groups. If you have a, if you work with this model and you actually have a centralized IT function, you then need to duplicate or figure out how to do cross account authentication between those multiple separate accounts. So there's an IAM management overhead that's involved. Um, and by doing this, you're actually avoiding or negating any of the cost optimization that you get through, through using RIs with linked accounts. Um, why would you, uh, talking about separate AWS accounts is actually a, a great scenario that I'd like to touch on for why you may want to use a separate unlinked AWS account. So why would you not potentially use an AWS account purely for logging and audit purposes? So as an example, if you were using multiple AWS accounts that are emitting CloudTrail logs 
um, or any other kind of logging that you may wish to, uh, AWS config, CloudTrail, any other kind of logging that you may wish to, to admit from your AWS account, you could actually configure a separate standalone AWS account that would only have write permissions for the services in each other account using cross-account access, which we'll touch upon in a bit more detail, uh, or which we have touched upon in more detail earlier on. You would use your cross-account access to allow them to write to that standalone AWS account but no one else would have right access. You'd effectively have a guaranteed, governable, auditable, read-only account where people would go and look at logging information across their AWS account and study, but guarantee that it couldn't have been changed or tampered with as you work across there. So you could run your security and instant management system in there and push logging and information in and ensure that no one else is actually able to go and change that and build, build your governance around that kind of model. An example of why you may actually choose to use an autonomous AWS account model or a hybrid model with the two that we're about to talk, talk about. So the next account model, and this, this is probably the most traditional kind of one-to-many linked account model that we'll find. Uh, it's also one that you'll find in most larger organizations is the, the single master. So when we talked about consolidated billing earlier on, uh, this is the model that we we're effectively talking about. You designate account A as your master payer account, and then you link your child account, so accounts B and account C, into that master payer account, and you get all the benefits of consolidated billing. Um, you get uh, usage that's reported back up into the master payer account. You can still access DBRs or detailed billing reports for each individual child account, but you ultimately get one large billing report for every AWS account that you have linked. You can pay through it for a single source, um, and there are many reasons that you may wish to do this. It allows for, for more centralized governance. So you can delegate individual accounts for workloads, departments, or projects that still have the billing managed to a central organization. Centralized finance can still track the costs of your AWS expenditure on a month-by-month -month basis. And you, you can use it to, to provide that isolation of your, your environment. So where we talk about prod versus non-prod, you can do that in this account structure without worrying about too much about the complexity of the billing piece. And you can use IAM to manage that cross-account access. So where we talked about uh, cross-account access within the IAM function and using roles or resource policies, you can configure that so that you actually, as per the, the diagram, have all of your IAM users existing in the master payer account at the top. Or a child account, you don't have to put them in the master payer account, but you can put all of your IAM users into a single account with no other AWS resources, and then you can configure uh, your other child accounts to trust that, be trusting of that IAM account, and then you only have to configure your users in one location and grant them roles or resource-based permissions elsewhere into your other accounts. So there are ways you can simplify this and still get the benefits of that single master-based approach. Um, obviously, there is some overhead involved in this. IAM can very quickly get complicated once you start to do cross account and across many AWS child accounts. Uh, and there's an administrative overhead involved in setting up and linking child accounts and moving the billing through. Uh, you also need to consider your AWS tagging taxonomy when you do this because you're passing tags up through the detailed billing reports to the master account. So you need to uh, agree on uh, a cross account tagging taxonomy as you go. You can then move on to the final model, which is actually a multi-master approach. So with this model, you're effectively leveraging, um, as a very large or enterprise organization, you're effectively leveraging uh, the master, the, the, the single master model, but you can apply a single master with child accounts to each part of your enterprise organization. So if you have a very large multinational, that may be operating in distinct regions and actually have separate financial responsibilities, payment methods, financial governance practices in each region, you can set up a multi-master model in an actual fact. This allows you to access the, the benefits of consolidated billing, the cost optimizations, the security model of using that centralized governance point for each region. But again, this is effectively deploying a single master multiple times but obviously, if you were running in a large enterprise organization, you may wish to have one global security function operating. So you would actually link, uh, you would use a, a separate autonomous AWS account somewhere in the middle of those multi-master models deployed. And you could, again, admit the logging that I discussed earlier on into there and, and still provide that, that overall global governance point of view while allowing individual business unit um, 
fluidity and function. Um, when you start moving into multi-masters, you do really start getting into uh, complexity of managing and governing IAM policies across the many master and child accounts. And you do lose some of the cost efficiencies uh, by having multiple master accounts because you no longer can benefit from RI spreading across multiple masters, uh, multiple accounts between the masters. And you also then start to lose out potentially on some of the, the, the volume pricing that you may be able to access by using these multiple accounts under a single consolidated billing account. And so moving on, we're actually going to just touch on on kind of rounding up some of the, the, the challenges that are involved in your AWS account strategy and, and figuring out how you can potentially simplify that. So being really honest, every model that, that we've talked about today has operational challenges associated with it. There is no one single model that fits every organization. You have to, to, to weigh up and make an informed decision based on the, the pros and cons of each model for each pattern and the way your organization works. You can go out and either write or purchase additional tooling to help you manage some of this complexity across multiple accounts. Um, or you can um, partner with, with a, an existing kind of tooling provider to do that. I've mentioned it a couple of times throughout this, IAM can very quickly become complex. IAM is uh, one of those very, very powerful services. It provides really granular access and permissioning across AWS resources. But once you start getting into complex configurations and deployments, it becomes very, very um, unwieldy to, to manage it at great scale. Um, and you start to find it's more and more difficult to, to achieve that kind of quick optimization and, and access control that you, you initially have when you start using IAM. Um, and another important point to note, may seem fairly obvious, but as you start to scale your usage of AWS, so the effort involved in cost analysis and maintaining governance um, increases along with that, that usage. So uh, it's not uncommon for a large account to be operating in a, a linked or a consolidated billing mode. You get that single detailed billing report up in your master payer account. It's not impossible for you to have uh, a single DBR for a month that could be many, many gigabytes in size. At that point, it's no longer possible to import that detailed billing file into Excel and just manually crunch the numbers. At that point, you need to come up with some sort of pattern or method of actually analyzing and, and looking for cost optimizations across your accounts using automated tooling or, or scripting. And so, this kind of brings us to the end. I know we've got a couple of questions that have come in over the course of this. We'll, we'll address those in a moment, but this kind of rounds off uh, the end of, of what we do. And, um, it'd be remiss of me not to kind of cover this off at the end, but hopefully the information that we've kind of provided throughout the course of this webinar um, and to the associated white paper is useful and helps you understand better how you can make use of accounts within AWS. So talking about accounts as boundaries for security or billing, or governance um, and you can now kind of take the, the information that's come out through this web, webinar and map some of your business's needs back to how you can choose the right pattern or model for that organization. Um, I would be remiss if I weren't to mention that obviously I work for Rackspace and as part of this, this, this webinar we've talked very high level about how you can manage your AWS account strategy. An actual support for AWS is the offering that we brought to market in October. Uh, we actually have many certified AWS experts who can actually help you make these decisions and implement them within your AWS environment. We have a lot of certified AWS architects. We have a lot of experience building these models for people already. We can help you figure out the correct pattern or model for your business if you're unsure. We can help you implement it. Um, and along with helping you with those kind of account implementation decisions, we can actually help provide solutions to the most common pain points that I've touched upon in this. So. Uh, where we talk about some of our tooling, we provide cross-account federation by default across any AWS account that you've set up under Fanatical support for AWS. Using our, our tooling and automation, you can create a single user identity and automatically map it to IAM roles within each other AWS account that's set up automatically. We provide some standard and default IAM roles that you may wish to use for read-only or full access, and we can help you using our expertise to build those custom IAM roles or policies that you need to secure with least privilege across your IAM configuration. Um, on top of building that account structure for you and helping you simplify some of those points, we can then also help with migration, architecture, security and operations, bins, 
some of the most common pain points that we see people coming to us to help with. Uh, and we'd love to understand, you know, what your needs may be with AWS and how we could help. So please don't hesitate to reach out uh, and talk to us about how we could help you out with your AWS accounts and usage. Uh, you can contact us uh, at the email address on the screen, so aws.experts at rackspace.com or visit our website at rackspace.com forward slash AWS. Um, or a shameless plug for uh, blog.rackspace.com forward slash AWS, which is actually where you'll find a lot of content being generated around things like account best practice or um, configuration or even useful how to's on how to configure certain services. We're going to be adding to that over time um, and we hope that it's going to provide a useful resource for our customers and the general AWS users out there as well. Thank you very much for taking the time out of your days to attend this webinar. Uh, please feel free to come and visit us at the website or the blog. Reach out to us via email. We'd love to talk to you if you have any uh, questions or concerns or you just really want to talk to us about how we could help you with your AWS management and strategy. Please reach out. Thanks very much and have a great day, everybody.